We live in a world of amazing innovation, but it didn't just appear overnight. Progress isn't a straight line. It's a river with knowledge flowing from many sources, interconnected with each other. Knowledge doesn't have patent of any civilization, but the contribution from all. Let me show you how. We all think that steam engine was invented in the 18th century, that it was James Watt sparking the industrial revolution. But what if I told you that the first working steam-powered machine was invented nearly 2,000 years earlier? Meet Heron of Alexandria, a genius of the first century C, a man ahead of his time, a man who built the first known steam-powered device. Heron was not alone. His works were part of something much greater, the Library of Alexandria, a place where the knowledge of the Greeks, Egyptians, Indians, and Mesopotamians was gathered in one grand pursuit, and that was to understand the universe. But knowledge is fragile, and the library of Alexandria was doomed. First came Julius Caesar's siege in 48 BCE. The flames consumed part of the library. Then in 391 CE, the Christian purge under Theophilus wiped out what remained of the ancient world's greatest knowledge center. But knowledge never truly dies. It moves, and in Persia, it was reborn. Emperor Shapur I understood something that Rome had failed to grasp, that knowledge was power. While the West burned books, he gathered them. While others destroyed, he built a great library in the city of Gandeshapur. Greek philosophy, Persian science, and the Indian medicine came together. The lost texts of Alexandria were reborn. While this was going on, the mighty Persians of the East and the iron-willed Romans of the West were fighting for dominance. A cycle of war, betrayal, and bloodshed that had drained them both. In the middle of it all, a new force was rising. While Persia and Rome fought to the death in a quiet cave in Mecca, a man received a message that would reshape history. Then came the Islam. In 7th century, with the fall of the Sasanian Empire, the rise of Islam emerged. History is filled with conquerors who destroyed what they didn't understand. Islam took a different path. The Quran itself taught, Iqra bismi rabbika allazi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who created. And so the Muslims read. They studied, they built upon what came before them. Instead of erasing history, they expanded it. Instead of destroying libraries, they created new ones. And in just 100 years, from 633 to 711, the Islamic empire grew faster than any before. It stretched from Pakistan today to Spain and even Central Asia, a vast land of many people, faiths and cultures united under one rule. La ilaha illallah. But this empire was unique. Majority of its people initially were not Muslim, but Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, Zoroastrians, all lived together. That was the empire's strength unity and diversity. When Muslims conquered Gande Shapur, they found its great academy, the world's best center of learning. Instead of destroying it, they protected it. Here, Greek science, Persian astronomy, and Indian math still thrived. The knowledge of Alexandria, saved by Persia, now had new guardians. The Abbasid Caliphate built Bayt al the house of wisdom in Baghdad, where they will transfer this knowledge. This was Islam's greatest gift to the world, a library to collect, translate, and develop human knowledge to new heights. Then came Al-Kindi, a brilliant scholar. Caliph Al-Mamun invited him to the house of wisdom. His mission was to translate Greek books by Pluto, Aristotle, and many more into Arabic. And for the first time, ideas lost for centuries were reborn. The House of Wisdom did not start from nothing. It stood on the work of Gandeshapur scholars, the wisdom of Syria's scribes, and the curiosity of a civilization that asked, what can we learn from others? Alexandria's light had faded, but in Baghdad, under Islam, it burned brighter. This light would soon guide Europe out of darkness and into a new age of science, medicine, discovery. Though there are numerous great achievements by Islamic civilization, but we will talk about three great discoveries we have not heard usually. Gothic cathedrals are famous 
European buildings for the Middle Ages, but they weren't entirely a European invention. Many of their key features came from Islamic architecture. The pointed arch, a defining feature of Gothic cathedral, was used in mosques like the Great Mosque of Cordoba and the Al-Aqsa Mosque long before European cathedrals were built. European architects adopted this design but didn't give credit to its origins. Ribbed walls, which make the ceilings of the cathedrals look like the star-filled skies, were also developed by Islamic engineers in Spain and Syria. These techniques allowed for taller and stronger ceilings. When Toledo was conquered by Christians, they found Arabic books containing these architectural secrets, which were then translated and used in Gothic cathedral constructions. Even the famous architect Sir Christopher Wren, who designed the St. Paul's Cathedral in London, admitted that Gothic style should really be called the Muslim style. However, the Islamic origins of these ideas were forgotten. Gothic cathedrals became symbols of Western culture, and their connections to Islamic architecture was hidden. So the next time you walk into a gothic cathedral or see one in a movie or visit one on your travels, ask yourself, whose legacy are you truly witnessing? History is written by the victors, but truth, truth is written in stone. We all learned in school that Copernicus was the genius who figured out that Earth goes around the sun. Right? Well, that's not quite the whole story. It's like reading only the last chapter of a really interesting book. For centuries, people believed that Earth was the center of everything. It seemed like it, but there was a problem. The planets sometimes looked like they were moving backwards in the sky. To explain this, they had this complicated idea, epicycles. Imagine like little loops the planets made as they went around the Earth. It was messy and it didn't really explain things well. Meanwhile, in the Islamic world, brilliant astronomers were working on this too. They were like detectives of the sky trying to figure out how the planets move. Ibn al shatir Al-Tusi, Al-Shirazi, these were some of the big names. Ibn al shatir came up with a model that got rid of those complicated loops. It's amazing how similar it looks to what Copernicus came up with later. Al-Tusi had this clever mathematical trick the Tusi couple to explain how planets move and Al-Shirazi made these models even better. These guys were way ahead of their time. So how did these ideas get to Europe? Well, lots of Arabic books were being translated into Latin. Copernicus probably read those translations and learned about the work of those Islamic astronomers. But unfortunately, these astronomers didn't always get the credit they deserved. The story we usually hear focuses on Copernicus, but he built on the work of others. The Copernican revolution wasn't just one person achievement. It was the result of centuries of work, including the amazing discovery of astronomers from the Islamic world. It's a reminder that science is a global effort, a conversation across cultures and time. Algebra is a fundamental tool in math, science, and even computer programming. But where did it really come from? Lots of people know the name of Al-Khwarizmi, but there's more to the story. Long before Al-Khwarizmi, mathematicians in India were doing amazing things with numbers. They had sophisticated number system, including the crucial concept of zero, and they were already working with equations. It's really important to give credit where it's due. India has a rich mathematical history, and their work definitely influenced what came later. Al-Khwarizmi, who lived in Baghdad in the 9th century, he took those existing ideas and organized them. And he wrote a book, Al-Qitab Al-Mukhtasar Fil Hasab Al-Jabr Wal Muqabala. That's where we get the word algebra from Al-Jabr, which basically means restoration or completion. Think of it this way. Indian mathematicians were like talented chefs who could cook up amazing dishes, but they didn't write down any recipes. Al-Khwarizmi was like chef who wrote up the cookbook. He gave us the instruction. Let's take a simple example. Imagine a puzzle. Find a number that when you double it and add 3 equals 11. Indian mathematicians were great at solving these kinds of puzzles. They might have used guess and check or some clever thinking to find the answer which is 4. Well, Al-Khwarizmi gave us a method for solving any puzzle like this. He created a step-by-step -step process. First, he would say, let's call the unknown number x, so our puzzle becomes 2x plus 3 equals to 11. Then he would show how to keep the equation balanced. If you subtract 3 from one side, you have to subtract from the other side, which means 2x equals to 8. And finally, he would show off how to find x by dividing both sides by 2. And that's how you get 4. Now, the point is he didn't just solve one puzzle. He gave a system for solving any similar puzzle. That's the key. He gave us the framework for what we call now algebra.
So while Indian mathematicians made huge contributions, Al-Khwarizmi took those ideas and turned them into something even more powerful, a complete organized system. So from steam power to algebra, from astronomy to architecture, the Islamic world left an extraordinary legacy. A legacy that shaped our world in countless ways. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? How did such a brilliant civilization, so dedicated to knowledge and innovation, eventually decline? What happened? Well, that's a story for another time. But this story holds an important lesson for us today. That knowledge isn't confined by borders of time. It's a shared human heritage built upon the contributions of many.